Hello, and welcome to the Full Earth Workshop. My name is Doug. This is the final episode of the slot car restoration of our Cox Chaparral 2. Man, it's a cool slot car, and we've done quite a few improvements on the interior and exterior of this car. At this point, we've done a couple of the white paint coats, and now we're into the first of the gloss coats, and you can see that it does a pretty good job. One caveat that I gotta make here, you gotta make sure your room is dust free. I got a little too much dust into this white finish for my taste, but uh, you know, when you get to this point, you just kinda gotta roll with it. And now, after this first gloss coat, I'm gonna start masking because the interior is next. You have to be very careful with white paint and other light colors, especially when you do the masking because it's really funny how pesky Paint colors can get up underneath the mask. You gotta make sure that all these edges are really down tight. And now just to make sure that you don't think I've got it all together, there you go. I did not screw the lid down tightly and I paid for it. Notice it's all over my, uh, it's all over my cutting board now. <laughs> anyway, go boldly forward. Let's paint the interior of this. This is actually a flatter, a semi-gloss paint, and we're gonna make up for that later on by putting some gloss over it, because apparently this entire body was done in a gel coat. Now come the body side panels, which are often misinterpreted as black. I think one of the problems was that originally, a lot of the photographs were in black and white. But if you see some color photographs, you'll notice that it is kind of a reddish brown. I took one of the colors from to me and added a little bit of red to it to give you a good indication of what those original colors were. And now that I'm painting the instrument panel, I kind of wish I had done this before I glued it in because it gets a little tricky to do. It just takes a little bit more time. Now comes the seat itself. The molding of the cock seat right into the housing makes it a little more tricky to paint, but uh, as long as you're careful, you can get some straight lines out of it. I do find that when I paint, it's very helpful to hold with one hand, you hold the body. The second hand you keep down on the surface works slowly, but that helps your hands to not shake as much when you're painting and try to use straight lines when you paint. Make sure there's enough paint on the brush that you can put a nice flat line down and then just make that stroke. Try your best when you're doing the masking to get those radiuses in there, but if you see some edges that you don't like, you can very gently go in with an X-Acto blade and uh, take away some of that paint if you're very, very gentle. Well, here's a little bit of cool history. These vents are called NACA ducts or N-A-C-A. The NACA was the precursor to NASA, and they invented these for aircraft. And what it does is it creates a little vortices around the outside of the craft without disturbing too much of the airflow. So <laughs> this was, of course, used by Jim Hall from the Chaparral team because he was an aeronautical engineer. It's pretty hard to find some original decals from these Chaparral 2 cars because, well, they'd be about 50 years old at this time. So there are a lot of reproductions that are done on laser printers. Still a little bit of jaggies around the outside edge, but remember when you buy these, you've got to cut around them. They're not die cut. So you have to make sure there's as little of the clear material as possible around them. And notice now on the photograph, sometimes there is paint that is put underneath these decals, but you can see in the original photographs that some of that reddish brown color leaks out from underneath. So that's the way we are putting this one together. Now this gloss coat is something we call the sealing coat. Right after you put the decals on, you spray this over. What you want to do is make these decals actually sublimate into the surface so they don't pop out. You know that when you were a kid, you know, when you first started making your models, and if you didn't do this, there would be a different surface. There would be kind of a semi-gloss or a gloss on a flat. Didn't look right. You gotta make sure you sublimate these uh, decals. One of the side effects of spraying everything is, well, some of the stuff needs to be flat. You can go back later on with some flattening spray and flatten these little parts out. 
One thing I do to try to protect the finish on the outside of the car is to do as much gluing as possible on the inside. And that's the way we fasten down this brass roll cage that uh, we put in earlier. And also the steering column. Notice that making it a little bit thicker like we did with the brass tubing does make it look a bit more realistic and not as awkward as the original Cox parts. If you notice on the exhaust section here, I've actually used some flat black at the bottom of the pipes and that kind of makes that chrome go away. That's a real important thing to make it look scale. A lot of times it's a very difficult thing to do, but it's worth the time going back in and blacking out those areas. You don't want to shine underneath. Hey, hang on, this is not an official paintbrush. Actually, this little tool came from replacing a battery on an iPad. <laughs> But it works great to paint in little tiny areas like these uh, tail lights. Just the intersection of them is painted. And remember, if you make a little mistake, just go back in with an X-Acto and very lightly scrape it away. It uh, actually works real well to uh, hide some of your mistakes that you've made. So how many of us have had problems putting in clear parts <laughs> without getting them messed up? Well, me too. And I found some glue that I think is a, is a new product and it's cheap and it works really well for this. So I'll show you that a little bit later on. Before I put in my windshields or any other glass parts, I normally cover them with Pledge Floor Wax. I uh, wasn't able to find it for this model, so I need to wait until it shows up at my store and, and I'll stock up maybe for the rest of my life. Time to start working on the brushes and we bring out the big gun. I love this thing. This is called a blazer and it's made in the USA, available a lot of different places, especially eBay and Amazon. It's about 50 bucks, but I tell you, the thing is great. It's great for doing any kind of soldering, especially something that is over a large area. You need to heat a lot of stuff. I use this for my brass model that I'm building in the other series. So I'm stealing the little brass wraparound from the OEM brushes that are kind of worn out and then putting it on some uh, new brush or braided material. It just makes these new found braids look like the original Cox material. You just heat up the whole area and the solder kind of sublimates down into the surface. Now you really don't have to do all of this. Sometimes I just take the most difficult way to the finish line. I had the tools laying around. What the heck? We'll try to do it. Using what they call in the UK a planishing hammer, I just do one little hit, it puts a hole in the brush, and we are ready to mount it up. These are the original wires. They had the funk of 10,000 years on them, so use some Bestine to clean them off before we put the screws in. You gotta make sure you fish these wires through the wheelie bar before you do the soldering onto the motor contacts. Cox had some really cool engineering on this wheelie bar. They had a little spring in there associated with some screws that made that thing push down just slightly onto the track when it was driving. It was really cool. Unfortunately, it causes a bit of a problem when you're restoring these chassis because sometimes that small screw gets stuck. And believe me, you'll do more damage taking that thing out than just leaving it stuck. Which means you really can't put that spring back in the correct way. So we're going to lose that to time, but it will work fine on the track. This is one part you see missing from a lot of the vintage cars. There was a little piece of brass that was included with the kit. And what it would do, it would make sure that you would put a stop in for that shoe and make sure it doesn't go way up into the car. And of course, when we were kids, we worked on these things and thought, what the heck is this thing? You throw, you throw it away. Well, I was lucky enough to find one, so we will use it here just to make that shoe fit in the right position. Yeah, we are looking greasy and mean at this point. It's time to try to put in that windshield. Here's the stuff that I found at a local Walmart store. It's this Elmer's Clear Glue. And we used to use just the original Elmer's, which kind of dries to a yellowish color. This stuff's perfect and white. Now, to make the rear view mirror, which was conveniently missing, I found this ballpoint pen. Look at that little thing there. That looks like the original rear view mirror. We cut it, we put a little hole into it, put some brass into it. Man, this is good as it gets. We put in just a little hit of that super glue to fill in the area and we'll go back and paint it later on with a silver paint, kind of give an impression of a mirror that's in that spot. And using the Elmer's clear glue, glues right in, that looks pretty authentic. All right, we have passed all inspections and we are ready to race.
that wraps up this project, and let's give a little credit where credit is due. You see some materials that you might want to buy and write it down. And if you like today's show and maybe want to just continue on with us, we would love it. Best way to help the channel is to subscribe and pass it along to people you love. Bridgehampton, Long Island, on a 2.85-mile track, hewn from Sandy Hillocks on the tip of Long Island. Texan Half Sharp, partner and co-driver with Jim Hall on the Chaparral team, concentrates on the course. It's one of the most difficult courses to drive in the uh, country, Chris. It's a very challenging track. It's got... Uh, some fast sweeps and uh, a lot of blind corners. Getting out of the main pit into the main straight, you drop immediately into the downhill turn one. first. 